In today's world, people feel lost in a sea of ideas. Which ones should we accept? Stay tuned because you're listening to Veracity Hill, striving for truth on faith, politics, and society. Here is your host, Kurt Jarris. Well, a good day to you, and thanks for joining us here on another episode of Veracity Hill, where we are striving for truth on faith, politics, and society. We are continuing our Explore God series with you today. Uh, This is week number uh, three, I believe. Chris, is that right? Week three, Explore God. Week number one, we talked about the meaning and purpose of life. And uh, joining us on that episode a couple weeks ago is Dr. Doug Groteis. And uh, we went through his um, Philosophy in Seven Sentences book, some of the most important uh, sentences in the history of uh, at least Western philosophy. He doesn't discredit Eastern philosophy, but he's just looking at Western and uh, how some of those uh, uh, statements from philosophy uh, over the past, oh, two and a half thousand years uh, (laughs) really uh, do bring about uh, what man's purpose is in life and can lead us to um, not just faith in the Creator God, but even the Christian God. And uh, last week, uh, we were joined by Dr. Tyler McNabb as we explored the evidence for God, or, or really not so much just offering reasons like the cosmological argument or the teleological or moral argument, but we were talking about methodologies for how we can uh, come to belief in God, and that uh, Dr. McNabb's position was that belief in God is properly basic. It's just, um, uh, there's a a part of us that uh, has this belief and that having that belief is justified and warranted. Uh, So that was the view that he was uh, defending. Uh, So if you haven't had the chance, I want to encourage you to go back and uh, listen to those episodes or watch them on our Facebook page. And uh, speaking of watching, this spring, our goal is to get all of the, and Chris has been dogging me on it, uh, (laughs) get all of our old episodes up on a YouTube channel. We've had the YouTube channel, we just haven't put forward the time to editing some of the older episodes and getting those up first. Um, and, And actually just little known fact, YouTube doesn't allow you to backdate those episodes, and I'm just kind of particular in how they appear. So we're working on that this spring. If you want to help us uh, to continue to grow our ministry and how we reach people, will you consider supporting us? Uh, Go to veracityhill.com and click on that patron tab. We need your support to continue our program growing into places it hasn't gone before. Uh, So please consider that. On today's episode, we're talking about uh, the problem of evil and suffering. Again, this is part of the Explore God uh, series, and these are part of what are the deep questions of life, and um, this certainly is one of, if not the most thought of question of those deep questions. Why is it that if God exists, uh, that there is so much, that there is evil, that there is so much evil, or really sometimes with a lot of people, why is there evil in my life? That what's called the pastoral problem of evil, um, people really experience and deal with it. Uh, it, whether they know someone or they've experienced it themselves, they, they lose a best friend, uh, in a freak accident. Uh, they, you know, a, a parent passes away at a young age and a person has to go through hardship. Where was God? Uh, that's an important question they ask. Uh, so, the problem of evil is uh, one of the most thought of questions in the Explore God series that we're doing. And to help us uh, think through this very tricky issue, uh, we have uh, asked onto our program today uh, Dr. John Peckham. He is a professor of theology and Christian philosophy at Andrews University, specific specifically the Seventh-day Adventist uh, Theological Seminary there in Berrien Springs, Michigan. Uh, John, thank you so much for joining us on our program today. My pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Yes, so now you are the author of a recent book here put out by uh, Baker Academic, Baker uh, Books, Baker Academic, Theodicy of Love, Cosmic Conflict, and uh, The Problem of Evil. And this came out just uh, late last year. And so... What, what drew my attention to it was uh, that I, as some of my followers may know, I, I'm sympathetic to a Boydian view of cosmic warfare, uh, but not necessarily his view on divine foreknowledge. He's an open theist. And so uh, that drew me to, uh, to your book here, because I see here, Cosmic Conflict, 
which we do read in the scriptures. Uh, but you certainly do take a different approach to divine foreknowledge and have a different view of sovereignty than he does. Um, and I- I'm sure we're going to get a little technical, but hopefully we're not going to get too technical on the program today. And we will uh, we'll try and simplify things uh, for uh, those that are unfamiliar with this material. So you start off the book uh, by talking about the free will defense, uh, which, as so- some people know, was um, defended by Alvin Planninga. Uh, and uh, we've done some episodes on this, if you go back through our, uh, our listing. And so why don't you give us a brief summary of what the free will defense is and, and why um, we should give uh, credence, if, if at all, uh, to it. Yeah, so so as you mentioned, uh, Alvin Planning is famous for his articulation of the free will defense in recent decades, uh, but it goes back uh, much much further than that, at least uh, all the way back to Augustine. And the free will defense just basically takes the view that uh, the logical problem of evil can be resolved by adding an additional premise, and that premise is that creatures have been granted free will and creatures misused that free will, and that introduced evil. So the the logical problem of evil is the problem that if God is all-powerful, and God is all-knowing, and God is entirely good, it appears to some, and some philosophers have argued, that there should be no evil in the world. And some, uh, especially decades ago, argued that there was just no way to hold all of those premises together uh, consistently. But Alvin Plantinga argued that if God grants creatures free will, uh, free will of the kind that he called significant freedom, which means they have, basically means they have free will to depart from what God wants them to do, or free will to do evil. If they have that kind of freedom, then God can't grant them that kind of freedom, and at the same time determine that they always do only what is good. So on the free will defense, creatures have that kind of free will, And therefore, it's not up to God whether or not they introduce evil. Tragically, some creatures did do evil, and that's why there's evil in the world. It was so successful that even uh, many atheist philosophers have claimed that the logical problem of evil has been defeated by planning as free will defense, which which is absolutely brilliant. Yes, yes. And one I know, I think J.L. Mackey was one of those to go on the record. Uh, And so, yeah, it's just been a, I don't want to say wildly successful, but yeah, it, it has as you said, defeated, put to rest that concern Mm -hmm. that the two couldn't coexist at the same time. That is evil and um, God's goodness and and, and whatnot. Um, Okay, so um, now this can get into, um, and and we're going to get into uh, uh, some some philosophical concepts today. Uh, One of the concerns you have in your book uh, is about what's called determinism and indeterminism. And and your concern, as you described, is that uh, given most forms, uh, if not all, depending upon how you label it, forms of determinism, uh, it seems to make God out to be morally repugnant um, because humans might not retain the type of freedom that would be required for them to be exclusively responsible. That is, God draws responsibility on certain forms of determinism, if not all, um, that he is the one bringing about this evil. Uh, Is that an accurate assessment here? Yeah, I think that's right. If God, on on many forms of determinism or theistic determinism, which is the view that uh, everything that occurs, uh, God causally determines to occur as it does, then God would, would... be causally responsible for evil in the world. Now, there are some ways that determinists, uh, although I don't hold that view myself, can can try to uh, resolve the problem of evil. One of the most popular ways is to just say, we don't know what God's reasons might be for determining evil, and because we're merely humans, we shouldn't really expect to be in a position to know that. So God has his reasons, and therefore there's no way to say that uh, God's omnipotence and omnibenevolence uh, could not coexist with the evil that we see in the world. And some say that uh, God caused evil for his own glory, that somehow this manifests his glory. 
Uh, I have difficulties understanding how evil, particularly the kind of evil we see in this world, uh, could bring God, God glory. Uh, but those are some of the avenues that, that they would typically take to try to, to resolve the problem. Uh, but I think uh, that there's, there's better ways to address the problem. And I think that determinism is false. Uh, and I think there's biblical reasons for thinking determinism is false. Yeah. Now, um, in response to this, uh, some determinists might say, well, God doesn't appear sovereign on your view or isn't sovereign on your view. And uh, there's a, 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 a term or phrase uh, that's frequently used in discussions like these. Uh, does God get uh, what he wants? Mm -hmm. uh, and a sovereign God always gets what he wants. And a God which is not sovereign would not get what he wants. And so what would you have to say to that? Yeah, I would say at least two things. I probably want to say a lot more than what I'll say right here. <laughs> there's uh, a whole chapter on this in the book, yeah. Yeah, there's a whole chapter, <laughs> second chapter. Uh, but the first thing I would say is that uh, first it depends on one's definition of sovereignty, right? Uh, if you hold a view that God has exhaustive definite foreknowledge, which means he certainly knows uh, everything that will occur, including what will occur in the future, uh, you can have a very robust conception of sovereignty where God is the ruler of the world, and nothing uh, goes beyond his control in a broad sense without actually claiming determinism. So I think that sovereignty, rulership, very strong model of providence can still be upheld uh, with an indeterministic view such as the one I argue for in the book. Uh, then when it comes to the view that uh, if God were sovereign, he should always get what he wants or all of his desires should always be fulfilled. Uh, again, I think that's a, a mistaken view of sovereignty, but I also think if you just if you just read the Bible carefully, you'll find example after example after example where God at least claims that his desires are unfulfilled and speaks uh, very strongly in ways about things he doesn't want to happen. And then when they happen, like his people rebelling against him, he laments those occurrences and says things like, turn to me and relent. Or I think in Psalm 81, oh, how I wish that you would turn to me and then, then I would turn to you and rescue you. Mm. So you have uh, all over scripture these instances of what I call God's unfulfilled desires. And I think indeterminism is just the best way to account for those. And it also has many other advantages. Uh, and you go through and point out um, how uh, sometimes uh, determinists will say though, that they recognize these passages in Scripture, that God has these unfulfilled desires, um, but that there might be a greater good involved or that some greater desire of his takes place, takes precedence. Uh, what would you say in response to that? Yeah, this is a move that a number of determinists say that God, uh, there are things that God doesn't want to happen that happen, but he determines those things to happen because they are somehow necessary for some greater good. Uh, I think that kind of account is problematic on determinism, uh, because if God determines everything to happen the way it does, it's very difficult to give an account of why there would be anything God doesn't want to occur, occurring. And it's also very difficult to to argue that there would be some greater good for which God would need some evil to come about to bring that about. Because there's two ways that that could be the case. It could be the case that some greater good is only possible uh, because God determines it to be the case that some evil is necessary for that greater good. And if that were the case, then presumably God could determine it to be otherwise, if he's deterministic God. Uh, and the other option is to just say it is just like a brute fact or a necessary fact of reality that evil is necessary for this greater good. But if that were the case, that would be, in my view, somehow ground, grounded in God himself, because I believe God is the source and ground of everything that is. And then it wouldn't make sense to say that God actually doesn't desire that evil, because to do so would be to... Uh, desire something that's not congruent with his own nature and the nature of reality. So it's much more complicated than that, and I try to unpack it in the book. But basically, I don't think – I think determinism really struggles with coherently claiming that there are things God actually desires not to occur that do occur. Maybe we can um, bring it back a little here and think of an example. So uh, one very popular verse in discussions like these is 1 Timothy 2.4. God desires all men to be saved. Yes. Uh, now, on 
many deterministic views, you typically have something like, you know, five-point Calvinism, um, which by and large says the vast majority of humans are not saved, are not elect. So how is it that if God is sovereign, but yet desires all men to be saved, why didn't he just determine all of them to be saved? Exactly. Yes. Uh, and that's one of the examples that's very difficult for a determinist to respond to. And typically you have the responses, well, God has his reasons. We don't know what they are. Or one of the popular responses is that God needed to damn some eternally in order to manifest his, his wrath yeah. or manifest his justice, which is for his glory. Mm. Uh, but I don't think that there's uh, any intrinsic connection between God's glory and, and damning people. And I do, and I think God's wrath is just his appropriate response to evil. And there would be no need for a manifestation of God's wrath if there were no evil. Uh, so you, you note, and I, I thought it was stellar, if I may say. And, and by the way, I had, you know, uh, we frequently showcase a number of, of, of works by authors um, on, on our program. And uh, I don't have the time to always to read through all of them. That's just, you know, that's part of life. But I did have time this week to, to give yours a, a, a good look. And so that's why, you know, this topic interests me especially. So you had a stellar response to this point um, that, well, if God's doing it for, say, maximizing his glory, if mm -hmm. he's so sovereign, he could just put the maximal amount of glory uh, to be understood by all of the humans that are saved. There's there's nothing that says sending X amount of people to hell maximizes his glory if God can supposedly do, you know, whatever he wants, um, you know, with, with a disregard to, say, human freedom or something like that. That's right, because otherwise, if the determinist says that God actually needs evil to increase his glory, well, then they're saying his glory actually increases. And most Christian theists are not going to want to say that. Mm. So when they actually say it's for his glory, they usually mean it's for the manifestation of his glory, that creatures would recognize his glory in a greater way or recognize it maximally. And I argue in the book that if God determines everything, then he could determine uh, what we're actually aware of or what we recognize. And so he could determine that we immediately recognize his glory in a maximal way. And you wouldn't need evil as uh, a con contingent thing upon the basis of which we come to recognize God's glory. He could just make us all recognize his glory immediately. Mm. All right. So you uh, have sort of put aside these deterministic models. You've said they don't quite uh, make sense as is on their, on their own views, and they don't seem to fit with the biblical uh, data. Uh, so wh what is the position that you opt for? So in the book, uh, the, the large section of the book, the middle sections of the book and onward are dealing with a cosmic conflict uh, theodicy or defense, which I call theodicy of love. Uh, for the listener's sake, I want to be clear that when I use theodicy, I'm using it in the weaker sense of a possible explanation with regard to why God would permit evil. And I think that there is a lot of biblical evidence that there is a cosmic conflict uh, minimally defined as a conflict between God and celestial creatures that have rebelled against God, uh, the devil and fallen angels and so forth. And so I take that view, building on the free will defense, I think the free will defense is excellent, but I think that uh, there are questions that the free will defense doesn't address or doesn't address as much uh, as I think we might be able to with the cosmic conflict perspective. I see. Now, I know planning it himself, I think, opts for um, natural evil and suffering as having uh, a possible explanation of demonic activity. Um, but, yes. but you're right. It's, it's not exactly a thorough treatment um, of, of the biblical data on the cosmic warfare um, that's available to us. That's right. Planning it throws it out there as an option. And, and, and I think it's, I think the move he makes there is excellent, but he doesn't develop it. doesn't do very much with it. Um, mm. um, and part of what I'm doing in the book is developing that. Okay, and, and before, and I certainly want to spend uh, the bulk of talking about this, but before I move on to that, um, so what would you say then, given, broadly speaking, a sort of cosmic conflict approach, uh, how is it that God is sovereign uh, on that view? If you sort of dismissed the determinism view, which tries its best to say, well, we've got the sovereignty card, you know, how is it that God is sovereign if there's... Uh, a, a cosmic demonic warfare uh, view going on in the universe? Absolutely. This is a great question. I think this is uh, the biggest issue when people first hear about a cosmic conflict. 
uh, that causes some people to dismiss it prematurely because they think, you know, if God is all powerful, which of course he is, and the Bible teaches that he is, how could anyone be in conflict with him? Uh, how could there be anything like a cosmic conflict? And this is where it's very important to uh, very, very clearly state uh, that in the cosmic conflict view, as I think is taught in the Bible, and as I hold, uh, Satan and other fallen celestial beings are creatures and merely creatures. So there's a beginning to this conflict, and there's an end to this conflict. Secondly, the nature of the conflict is not one of sheer power. If it was, there could be no conflict. It's a conflict over character. It's a conflict, uh, what I call in the book, an epistemic conflict, or a conflict over belief. Uh, specifically wherein uh, the enemy, the devil, has slandered God's character and raised charges against God's character that can't be met by sheer force because you can't really defend your honor or your character by using power or force. Uh, so I would argue that if God grants creatures free will, including celestial creatures, and if a conflict arises over his character, uh, God could provide parameters or what I call in the book uh, rules of engagement a framework in which uh, those who have allegations against God's character can raise them and actually be in conflict with God, not because God lacks power, not because God ever lacks the power uh, to defeat the devil as a matter of, of sheer power, but because he has allowed this kind of freedom because that was necessary for the sake of love and given the allegations raised, necessary for the settling of the conflict in a way that creatures themselves can all come to know God and love him. Hmm. Interesting. And I, I look forward to fleshing this out further uh, during our, our program today. So uh, on your view, though, so you would say God doesn't always get what God wants, say, with like the meticulous details. But in, mm -hmm. an, in another broader sense, you would say that God does get what he wants because he creates a universe like this. Uh, mm -hmm. So he does, you know, he, 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 God does want a sandbox, but he lets other people play in the sandbox. Uh, so in that broad sense, he gets what he wants. Um, right. If we make a distinction between, I make a distinction between what I call God's ideal will, which is what God would want to be the case if everyone always did what he wants at all times. And then what I call his remedial will, which is God's will that takes into account the free decisions of creatures, which includes sadly bad decisions of creatures. So he, 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 sovereignly, providentially guides the universe toward the best outcome while respecting the freedom that he has granted to creatures. Uh, and so he does ultimately achieve his overarching purpose, but that purpose already uh, includes within it uh, the bad decisions of creatures and sadly the evil and pain and suffering that comes with this. Sometimes I, I illustrate this uh, for students uh, by analogy to like those, those cooking shows that are very popular where chefs are given like uh, one or two ingredients that they have to use and they can make anything they want, but they have to use that ingredient. Uh, it's a little bit analogous to that, except it's not that God has to use them, but insofar as he grants creatures free will and does that consistently, there's going to be factors uh, that affect what occurs in the universe that God is not meticulously controlling. Mm, mm. That's, a, that's a basic idea. Yeah, very nice. Um, all right. I... We've got a few minutes till our break here, um, but when I, what I want to do is we'll, we'll take a short break, uh, actually, I think. Um, so when we come back, I've got one announcement before that, but when we come back, we'll, we'll delve more into uh, this, this cosmic conflict uh, framework approach that you've got here. Very fascinating, especially uh, your uh, fourth chapter here on the rules of engagement. Uh, very much look forward to hearing more about that. If you have questions for John, uh, we are keeping tabs on our Facebook live stream uh, right now. And this is the way that we uh, have normally over the past now two and a half years come to you. Um, but perhaps you're one of the people now listening in Augusta, Georgia. Uh, Veracity Hill uh, at the start of this year began airing uh, our episodes uh, over there. And we look forward to uh, continuing our partnership with the Wilkins Radio Network. Uh, it's what... 10.50 a.m. over there uh, in Augusta, Georgia, airing a uh, noontime 
Eastern uh, on Saturday afternoons. So we uh, thank you for uh, our financial supporters who have contributed to uh, making that possible and look forward to the further blessings of, of people who have benefited from this program. If you have benefited, would you consider partnering with us? Uh, also, just before the program today, I sent out a, a text message to our followers. And if you're not familiar with our texting plan, you can text the word veracity to 555 555- 888 and that then you'll be signed up to our list and you'll get updates about upcoming programs and before today's program I quickly uh, shout out you know details on our our episodes so if you were off somewhere if you're listening in, in a car even you're driving you could uh, get the text message. Typically, there's a link. So you could be listening to this program right now, wherever you might be. And so if you haven't signed up for that, go ahead and just text the word veracity to 555-888. All right, we'll take our short break now. And uh, when we come back, we're uh, talking with John Peckham. Uh, He is the author of Theodicy of Love, Cosmic Conflict, and the Problem of Evil. Very fascinating topic for today's show uh, as we continue our Explore God series. So stick with us through this short break from our sponsors. You're listening to Veracity Hill, striving for truth on faith, politics, and society. Evangelical Christians are talking about hell. What if we believe what we believe because we've always believed it? What if the gospel is really a matter of life and death? We want you to open your mind, open your Bible, and rethink hell. At RethinkingHell.com, evangelicals look at what the Bible says about hell, putting conventional and controversial views to the test. Let's say there's this Christian apologist. You love their message, but have trouble finding their videos, their articles, or social media posts. How do you stay connected to them? We're on it. Defenders Media uses the tools of the digital age to create content for your favorite apologists. We give them more screen time, more digital soapboxes, and more presence to deliver more of the content that you love. That's what we do. I know that social media is important to those of you who follow my work. Many respond to my videos and posts on Facebook and Twitter, but it becomes impossible after a while to keep up with it all and to continue with research. That's why I'm thrilled that we have found a solution, Defenders Media. Whether it's a website, whether it's printed material, whether it's a question on graphics, I cannot do what I do and reach my audience without the help of Defenders Media. They have been integral in helping me to reach my audience. Defenders Media ensures consistent content reaches your hand from today's leading apologists and apologetic ministries, like Mike Lycona, Apologetics 315, the Veracity Hill Podcast with Kurt Jarris, and more. To learn more, text the word DEFENDERS to 555-888 and we'll send you a free PDF of the top five ways to share the gospel online. Thanks for sticking with us through that short break from our sponsors. If you'd like to learn how you can become a sponsor, Go to our website, veracityhill.com, and click on that patron tab, and you'll see some of the sponsorship options. Uh, We'd love to put up your company or organization's uh, logo, or maybe you want to play an advertisement during our break, and uh, eventually we'll get here. We'll we'll start playing some video ads, I think. We'll have to add that as a new level. That'd be great uh, with what we're doing. And um, Chris is telling me we're having some slight um, dropped frames. That's a technical term, and apparently... uh, He's diagnosed it as a problem with our internet provider, Comcast. Uh, So nothing on our end. So we apologize if you have some images that are freezing up. But the audio is typically still great. uh, So sorry about that. Also, um, in related technological news, uh, we are now pumping out 1080 uh, to Facebook. Did we start that last week or is this the first week, Chris? Last week with Tyler. Yeah. So um, we've been sort of manipulating it to look uh, awesome because Chris is a magician. His nickname is Merlin, actually. And uh, But now we have a, a device that's just properly pumping out 1080p high definition to Facebook week after week. So you can expect that henceforth. Um, 
All right. Uh, today we are joined uh, by John Peckham, author of Theodicy of Love. We're talking about the problem of evil and suffering, and uh, we're discussing theodicy, a possible way of reconciling uh, what we see here uh, in, in our world, why we experience evil, why we do suffer. And uh, the book has been proclaimed by Paul Copan, Jerry Walls, David Baggett, a number of great names out there in the apologetics community and, and philosophy of religion community. And so I want to encourage people to check that out, published by Baker Academic. We will also put a link to the book at our website if you're watching along there. Uh, actually, my uncle called me this week to say that he was watching on our website, going through some old uh, programs. So that was nice. Yeah, it's always nice when you have a family member that's tuning in. <laughs> uh, all right, uh, John, so now is the time of our show where we do a segment called Rapid Questions. And uh, I didn't tell you about this, and that's, you know, intentional. And so it's basically 60 seconds. We're going to ask you some questions just to learn more about you. Uh, totally unrelated to our, our show today. And so uh, if you are ready, I will start the game clock. Are you ready? I guess so. <laughs> yeah, I love it. I guess so. That's great. All right. Here we go. What is your clothing store of choice? Uh, I guess Kohl's. Taco Bell or KFC? Taco Bell. What's your most hated sports franchise? Oh, that's between the Red Sox and the Patriots. Okay. Uh, when's the last time you swam in a pool? Last time I swam in a pool? Oh, I don't know. I guess it's, it's been a while. Uh, do you have a garden? I do not. Okay. Um, look at... Oh, this is funny. Look at the clock. What is the actual time? <laughs> 2.38. <laughs> uh, let's see here. Uh, would you go bungee jumping or skydiving? I think probably neither, but I've had to choose. I'd go skydiving. Okay. Uh, do you drink Dr. Pepper? No. I'm sorry. Uh, let's see. What's one thing you'd be sure to keep with you if you were stranded on an island? Oh, um, water. <laughs> uh, pick a fictional character you'd like to meet. Uh, Sam Gamgee. Sam Gamgee. Nice. You know, that was actually pretty quick. Uh, that answer, we've asked that one. That, that's been a newer question on the program, and some people have had to take some time. Why Sam Gamgee? Oh, I, lo I love Sam in The Fellowship of the Rings. Uh, uh, at least in the movie version where he says uh, to Frodo, uh, Frodo says, you know, I'm leaving. I have to go alone. He says, I know, and I'm coming with you. Just, yes. just the friendship uh, aspect of the way that he supports oh. him at the quest. I've just always, always loved him. What a faithful friend, huh? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, he is. Uh, to me, he, um, he is the iconic Christian in yes. the, the Lord of the Rings series. Uh, yeah. He is faithful to the end. He carries your burdens. Oh, my gosh. Uh, right. I think a lot of people underestimate uh, the power of Sam as a character in that work of fiction. Um, a great testament to cultural apologetics and the need for it, to write great literature. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so for a lot of people, um, I, I've been actually talking to someone um, who we're hoping to get movie reviews at our, one of our websites, Apologetics 315, and I'm trying to uh, work with him and encourage him to to think, what does it mean to have, you know, great film, great art? What does that look like? So, at any rate, all right. So, uh, if you're just joining us, we're talking about uh, theodicy, uh, and we're talking about the problem of evil and suffering, why God would allow those things. Uh, now, John, in your book, you uh, defend a cosmic conflict, what you call a cosmic conflict. Maybe you distinguish that from the cosmic warfare, uh, which is Boyd's terminology, Greg Boyd. Uh, now, as we mentioned at the beginning of the show, Boyd holds to an open theist position on divine foreknowledge. That's not your view. Um, and you've also dismissed some more of the, the deterministic approaches uh, to understanding divine providence and why God would allow evil and suffering. And on deterministic models, it seems God is responsible in some way for the evil and uh, suffering in the world, uh, which is very um, unpalatable for many people. We want to say, no, God's all loving and he's not at fault for these things. It's the creatures. It's the rebellion. And so before we took our break, you talked about how the the warfare isn't so much about power and might. The, the conflict's not so much about that, but it's about um, honor. Uh, and that, um, well, I'll, I'll let you tell us uh, more about it again. It's about his, his name and how if, if people want to um, bring a case before him, right? So it's not about... Uh, sheer power um, 
but it's about something else. Tell us again. Yeah, yeah. This is a theme that, that many Old Testament and New Testament scholars have seen of something like uh, a cosmic courtroom drama or a cosmic covenant lawsuit where uh, the enemy, the devil, his M.O., is to slander. He's called the accuser of the brethren, uh, Diabolos, some New Testament scholars say, just as translated slanderer. And we see him slandering already in the form of a serpent in, in the Garden of Eden. You see him slandering all the way from the beginning to the end, uh, the character of God and the name of God. And so the conflict is, is really a conflict of character, an epistemic conflict. And at the center of that is, is love. And uh, in that conflict, God is meeting those allegations in a kind of cosmic courtroom uh, by a demonstration, because you can't really resolve a question of your character. Uh, if somebody alleges you uh, uh, alleges that you're corrupt, uh, you can't exercise power in order to defeat that allegation. You have to have some kind of evidence, some kind of demonstration. And that's what happens uh, in, in the history of redemption, ultimately at the cross, where God demonstrates his righteousness and demonstrates his love in a way that really defeats the enemy's allegations in the heavenly court. Uh, so that is the, the basic idea of the nature of the controversy. But it's very interesting in this conflict, uh, Jesus himself refers to the devil as the ruler of this world. And that language, if it makes any sense, requires that he has some jurisdiction, some rulership. Hmm. I was going to ask, if you could, what's some of the biblical data on this cosmic uh, approach. I know in the book of Daniel, we have a fascinating passage on um, f fighting between angels. Uh, tell us about yes. that. Yeah, Daniel 10 is one of, one, of the, one of the best examples of what I call rules of engagement. So you see this, this kind of uh, cosmic conflict. There's a cosmic courtroom or heavenly council scene uh, in the book of Daniel and Daniel 7 as well. But what you're referring to is in Daniel chapter 10, where Daniel is uh, praying to God uh, for understanding some of the prophecies that had come to him. And the text says he prayed and fasted for three weeks and uh, at the end of the three weeks, an angel comes saying that he was sent from God and he had been uh, from the first time Daniel's words were heard, uh, he, he was sent, but he was delayed by the prince of the kingdom of Persia, which many people, many Old Testament scholars believe is a celestial ruler behind the earthly ruler of Persia. And when you sit back and you, you realize what's happening in this, in this narrative in Daniel 10, you say, how could it be possible that an angel of God could be delayed for three weeks. If God wants them to be there immediately, he could exercise his power and they would be there immediately. This must mean that God is not exercising all of his power all the time. And it must mean further that God and uh, the kingdom of God, God's agents, angels, are uh, not exercising all of God's power either. They're working within some parameters. Mm -hmm. There's some real jurisdiction and real ability of the enemy to antagonize God and his kingdom. Uh, and Daniel 10 is one of many, many examples that we see of this. Uh, even if you just uh, look in the Gospels, you look in the book of Matthew, uh, you'll see cosmic conflict all the way through. Uh, you have the temptation nar narrative in Matthew 4, in Luke's account of that, uh, when the devil tries to tempt Jesus to bow down and worship him, he shows him all the kingdoms of the earth. And he says, all of this has been given over to me, and I can give it over to whomever I will, right? He's claiming this, this jurisdiction. And as I mentioned, Jesus already calls him the ruler of this world. And Jesus himself, when he tells the parable of the wheat and the tares, uh, when he gives an explanation for why there are tares or, or, or weeds in, in the landowner's field, which is roughly an analogy for the evil in the world, he says, an enemy has done this. And he clearly identifies this enemy as the devil. So once you see this cosmic conflict theme, which is just all the way through the Gospels, uh, and it's very well represented in the Old Testament as well. You, you can't unsee it. You kind of see it everywhere once, you, once you're aware of it. Mm. Uh, Jeffrey uh, from Nicar Nicaragua is actually tuning in. He's got a question that I think we'll answer a little bit later. Uh, so, Jeffrey, thank you for your question. We see it here. Let me ask you about, uh, John, about these rules of engagement. So we talked mm -hmm. here about the uh, Daniel 10. What's that about? What, what do you mean rules of engagement? Yeah, I... I I use the phrase rules of engagement for lack of a better term to refer to some parameters in which the devil and his domain of darkness, as it's called in the New Testament, uh, some parameters in which they can operate in opposition to God. 
if God is all powerful, obviously no one could do anything against him unless he gave them room to oppose him. And the rules of engagement are some non-arbitrary parameters in which the enemy can antagonize God and uh, uh, war against God's kingdom. And we see examples of these, again, all throughout Scripture. But one of uh, the most explicit examples is in the story of Job. In Job chapter 1 and Job chapter 2, you have two instances. They, they're almost identical to each other in the way they're introduced, where uh, the Satan comes to present himself before God, and the sons of God are there before the sons of God. This is language of that heavenly council or cosmic courtroom drama. And Satan raises a number of allegations uh, against Job and indirectly against God's judgment and treatment of Job. And one of the things that he says is, you have set a hedge around Job and everything that belongs to him, or you have put a fence around him, uh, which shows us at least two things. Satan was trying to harm Job and he couldn't, and that there were some existing limits on what Satan could do. And one of the things that Satan argues for before the heavenly court, it's not just him speaking to God, this is in kind of a, a cosmic courtroom, he argues that if you would just let me have more room to bring calamity against Job, then I could prove my point that Job isn't really who you say he is. He isn't really blameless. He isn't really upright. He's not really serving you or fearing you as he should. Mm. And so those fences, those uh, that hedge around him, are existing rules of engagement that apparently uh, Satan is lobbying to have changed a bit. Mm. Nice. And uh, so what you're saying here is that uh, God's not allowing um, – these rebellious forces to just do willy nilly uh, mm -hmm. as however they see fit. There are boundaries to what they can do. Yes, and uh, and and that's maybe in distinction to other approaches to the cosmic warfare, um, which says that God can't stop these people, or at least can't stop them right now. Um, right. I can think of some other names out there who, who defense for this cosmic warfare view, but just say that. This stuff happens gratuitously, um, whereas, yeah. you know, you're saying, no, there are boundaries, there are rules to the war that God allows. And, and even here with Job, it sounds like God's willing to stretch the rules a little um, to to accommodate, uh, you know, whether Job was really uh, faithful to him. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it seems to me that God takes into account uh, the other celestial beings, whoever they are in the heavenly council, and he agrees uh, that those parameters be modified in order to, to settle the claim that's being made. And I think he's doing this because in his infinite wisdom, he knows that that is the best way to settle the conflict for all concerned. But it's very important to, to recognize here that those rules are not arbitrary. They're not arbitrarily set by God. That's why the courtroom context is very important. Uh, and even though uh, they are ontologically restricting Satan, that is to say, that Satan doesn't have the power to go beyond the limits that God sets up because God is omnipotent. If God grants him some jurisdiction, then that morally limits what God will do in the future. Uh, because, uh, and this, is, this part is non-controversial, I think every Christian theist would agree that if God makes a promise, he'll always keep his promises. He will never go back on his word. So if he says, this is within your jurisdiction, and even more if he does it in a, in a courtroom context, then that also limits what God can morally do without in any way restricting his power. And so there are some parameters in which Satan can work temporarily, but God still retains the power uh, to finally put an end to him, and he will. And the book of Revelation just tells us that Satan knows that there are these limits, that they're temporary. In Revelation 12, it says that he knows his time is short. And there's many other indications that there are some parameters. We're not told just what they are, uh, but Satan and his kingdom know what they are. God knows what they are, and both parties respect those boundaries in the cosmic conflict. Uh, that's important for why God would allow evil, because if that's the case, then there may be many evils that God would otherwise prevent, and indeed does want to prevent, but to do so would require him to contravene the rules of engagement, mm. and thus do something that goes against his very character, mm. which would just play into the hands of the allegations. Huh. Fascinating. Um, we've got this language of courtroom, uh, you know, allegations and sort of these, this legal language. T tell me more about the, the, the heavenly courtroom picture here or what some Old, Old Testament scholars call the divine council. 
That's right. Yeah. Divine counsel is another term for it. And in, in both the Old Testament and the New Testament, there's a number of scenes. Well, one of them is in Job. You see it in Psalm 82. Uh, many people think Isaiah 6 uh, is an example. And then in Revelation 4 and 5, you have this heavenly court, which I also believe is this heavenly or divine counsel. And uh, many Old Testament scholars believe this is a, a, a court or of celestial agencies that have some uh, say so or some governance in what takes place in the world, but all under the sovereignty of God, who is the Most High. And I call it a heavenly council because I prefer to reserve the word divine for for God, the, the only uh, necessarily existent creator of all. Uh, but there are other celestial beings that we typically refer to uh, as, as angels, celestial creatures. And this council appears to be made up of those kinds of beings. And at least prior to the cross event, it's very interesting, uh, uh, and for those that this may sound a little bit foreign to, there's much more to read about this uh, in the book. Uh, but it's very interesting that many New Testament scholars think uh, that Satan ha- had, has some license as the ruler of this world. Probably he's given rulership uh, by the fall event. He claims rulership of this world, and he's given some license to go to this heavenly council until the cross. And then he's like banished from the council He's unmasked and excommunicated from the heavenly council. But up to that point, he appears uh, to be there antagonizing, as Revelation calls him, the accuser of the brethren. Uh, And there are other celestial creatures there as well. We just don't know much about them. Uh, So uh, you say up until the cross here. Um, So what you're suggesting is for the problem of evil and suffering, that evil has been defeated uh, and that... um, to use, uh, maybe Boyd uses, that we're still fighting these skirmishes. That might be N.T. Wright. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That, yeah. That, that uses that. So so evil is defeated, you're saying, um, but yes. it's not yet destroyed. Tell us about that. That's right. Yeah, Satan has been defeated, but not yet destroyed. And, and this is, he's defeated by Christ at the cross. And by the way, this is just one of the things the New Testament says Christ came to do. I would in no way reduce the work of Christ or the atonement to this, but one of the things it says he, he came to do was, uh, to destroy the works of the devil, that's in First John, uh, or to destroy the power of the devil, according to Hebrews. And this is what he does, and uh, this is the, the already not yet of the kingdom of God. He's established the kingdom, he's defeated the devil uh, in the heavenly court. Uh, the allegations of the devil have been defeated, uh, but the conflict still continues on the earth for some, some limited, finite period of time. Mm. Uh, this really brings to light uh, the life and ministry of Jesus. Uh, you, yes. c- you can see what he does uh, in healing people. It, it's, it, it presents a picture of Jesus as doing very important now work, not just, hey, let me die on the cross so I can save you in thousands of years time uh, and on the day of judgment. It really manifests itself in, in the world. And so we as uh, Christians are called to uh, to do what he did. And so we need to care for the poor, heal the sick. And we have our ways of doing that, of course. Um, am, I, am I on the right track here? Absolutely. I think that's one of the, the biggest practical advantages of a cosmic conflict approach, which is not to say others can't also also hold this, uh, but it motivates you if, you if you really think that there are things happening in the world that God doesn't want to, to have happen. There may be reasons why God can't morally prevent them. Maybe it would contravene the kind of free will he gives, or maybe it would go against the rules of engagement. But we, if we were willing, could prevent a lot of evils or bring a lot of good into the universe that God wants us to do. And so uh, everything that we do actually plays a role in this cosmic conflict as well uh, as uh, servants of God. And I think we should be very motivated to do this and recognize that uh, this world is under enemy jurisdiction. Uh, I think C.S. Lewis ta- calls this enemy, enemy territory, and we're part of the rebellion, right? And, and I think that's right. I think that's the way uh, the New Testament speaks of us. We're also called to be witnesses, right? This legal language isn't just a metaphor. Uh, Jesus himself says he came to testify to the truth. Uh, the apostles call themselves witnesses, and we're supposed to witness to the world about this character of our God. And one of the ways we do that is by proclamation, but another way we do it is by by actually uh, living the way someone who is a Christ follower sh- would and should live. Mm. Theology is uh, frequently a pick your poison game. Uh, the, you know, every every position it seems has some weakness to it. Um, so sometimes one of the, one of the questions I like to ask people is, 
given your model, what do you think are some of the weaknesses uh, of, of your approach here? Yeah, I think probably the biggest weakness of a cosmic conflict perspective is the perceived plausibility in the pluralistic world and, and largely secular Western culture that mm. we're in. Uh, many people don't believe in celestial beings, uh, devil, devils, demons, yet they're even willing to consider uh, one supreme God. Uh, that's difficult in and of itself. And so some would dismiss it out of hand just because of that. Uh, but I don't think that's anything like a defeater. Uh, uh, planning it again argues that uh, plausibility is in the ear of the hearer, as it were. And a lot of plausibility comes down to your background beliefs. And I think if we take scripture seriously, even if you just take the gospel seriously, uh, you see there at nearly every turn in the narratives, uh, cosmic conflict and a real devil and real demonic agencies at work. And uh, to me, uh, Christian worldview needs to be a worldview that's congruent with the Bible. So I don't think we're at liberty uh, to, to cast that aside. And anyone who's willing to entertain a biblical kind of Christianity, the cosmic conflict is, is just going to come with it. And I don't think it's implausible at all. I think most of the implausibility is because of uh, the rise of the Enlightenment, a very secular, disenchanted view of the world. But still, most of the cultures of the world believe in celestial beings. And the vast majority of humans that have ever lived believed uh, in celestial agencies. It's really a very small section of supposedly enlightened people that have adopted a different worldview uh, that I think uh, we just shouldn't capitulate to. I like that. Supposedly enlightened people. <laughs> very nice. Uh, we've got Steve Norton here. Uh, he's uh, watching along. He says, it's kind of interesting you are having this topic today. Immediately before tuning in here, I was listening to a song called Alone Again Naturally and contemplating a line in it that says, if he, God, really does exist, why did he desert me in my hour mm. of need? Mm. Uh, so there certainly are some people uh, who feel like they're deserted. Let me ask you this. How does your approach here to the problem of evil and suffering provide comfort uh, for those that are suffering. Yeah, there, and, and, th and this is so important. And there's much more to say about this uh, that my book doesn't even get into because I'm dealing mostly with a philosophical problem. But two things that I think uh, uh, are very comforting to me, at least, is number one, God is the God who becomes human in the incarnation, the second person of the Trinity, and gives himself for us and dies and suffers on the cross for us. And he not only suffers on the cross, I believe that he suffers when we suffer. So God is a transcendent God, but he's not only transcendent, he's imminent with us. Uh, and if there had been any other way for him to ensure the eternal flourishing of the universe, he would have chosen it, even if just to spare himself uh, from the cross event. Uh, secondly, I think when, when we see things happening in the world and we wonder where God is, I think it's helpful to recognize that, that God is not operating arbitrarily, and we don't need to think that when evils occur and God uh, does not prevent some evils from occurring, that it's because he wanted those things to occur, or that it's because even those specific events were, were themselves uh, needed to bring about something better. It might be that God desperately wants to uh, prevent those instances of evil, but to do so would actually undermine the free will necessary for love or go against the rules of engagement, or for all we know would actually lead to a worse outcome because God in his infinite wisdom knows the end from the beginning. So I think we can look to the cross and recognize that the God of the cross can be trusted. And when God appears distant, it, it might be that that's part of the limited and temporary jurisdiction of the enemy, but Christ has defeated Satan and he will uh, usher in a kingdom where there will be no more suffering no more tears, no more pain, no more death. Mm. Great. Uh, let me ask you this final question. Uh, it comes from Jeffrey uh, from Nicaragua here. He says, we know that God created everything and that there is no darkness in him. So how should we think about evil and suffering as part of reality and God mm -hmm. being the creator of everything? Yeah, I think of evil as uh, a parasite. So God created goodness. He created everything good. Uh, I think that to put it as briefly as I can, love requires freedom to reject love. I have an ar a brief argument for that in the book, but I won't uh, try to extrapolate that now. But if that is the, the if if love requires freedom to reject love, then love requires that creatures have the ability to choose evil. 
That means if God is love, uh, that love itself and God granting other creatures the freedom to love requires the possibility of evil. It doesn't require the actuality of evil. So God didn't create evil. It's not a thing to be created. Evil was actualized by creatures rebelling against God. And the possibility of evil isn't something that is uh, a, a created thing. It is something intrinsic uh, to the nature of the kind of freedom that love requires. But no one ever needed to actualize evil. Therefore, God didn't bring it into the world, and he's not culpable uh, for either its possibility or its actuality. Mm. Very good. A nice uh, summary to uh, to the episode here and, and your position. And again, for those that are interested, we will put a uh, link to the book here, Theodicy of Love, Cosmic Conflict and the Problem of Evil by Baker Academic. We'll put a link at our website so you can check that out. Uh, John, I know sometimes writing projects overlap each other. What's the next thing you're, you're working on? The next thing I'm working on is a book on divine attributes, a constructive treatment of, of the attributes of God. Okay, and and that is related here, the omnis, right? Yes. Uh, so very nice. So keep me posted on that, and we'll have to bring you on our program again. Great, I'd love to come back. Great, thank you, John. Uh, again, uh, this is John Peckham from uh, Andrews University uh, there in Berrien Springs, Michigan. Uh, now, John, uh, what's uh, the weather here in Chicago is just crazy cold right now. Yes, you're getting the same blast. It's the same here. Yeah, yeah. Single we'll digits, you know, below zero. So. Yeah, we're going to be below even worse next this coming week. Yeah, right. So. I, a high of negative seven on Wednesday, I think, which is exactly. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I'd rather be in Alaska right now. It's warmer there. That's right. Well, thanks for coming on our program. God, God bless you. Thanks for having me. Blessings to you. All right. Well, that does it for our, our program today. Uh, next week, as we continue our Explore God series, um, I will be presenting some thoughts on uh, whether Christianity is too narrow. And as I've been thinking through this, I've been talking to my wife about that question. And it really sort of depends on what someone means by narrow and by too, T-O-O. What is too narrow? Um, so I'll be talking about that. I've got three main points going through my mind right now. The nature of truth the futility of relativism, and the human condition, and how uh, these three uh, uh, factors will play into how we might answer that question. So I look forward to bringing those thoughts to you uh, on next week's episode, uh, which will be episode 134. We have been doing this program now for two and a half years every Saturday. And so I uh, would love for you to consider becoming one of our supporters to keep us going. I think I was joking, Chris, I think I was joking with you maybe a few weeks ago about a thousand episodes. If we did this program for like whatever, 10 years or something like that, or more than that, 20 years, that's a thousand episodes. <laughs> that would be crazy, but it would be great. I love uh, doing this and, and having this program here week after week. All right. Well, I'm grateful for the continued support of our patrons and the partnerships that we have with our sponsors. They are Defenders Media, Consult Kevin, The Sky Floor, Rethinking Hell, The Illinois Family Institute, and Fox Restoration. I want to thank our technical producer, Chris Yisley, uh, for all the great, wonderful work that he does week after week, and to our guest today, John Peckham. Uh, but last, and certainly not least, I want to thank you for listening in and for striving for truth on faith, politics, and society. You've been listening to Veracity Hill, striving for truth on faith, politics, and society. This is a listener-supported program. For more resources, including past shows, visit veracityhill.com.